This is Talk of Asian Marketing with a special emphasis on localized Chinese consumer behavior. Are at Zhengzhou Dashi, right? Yeah. yeah. Steven, right. your old school. Do you want to yeah, say a couple yeah. words about your school? What's our location like here? Uh, this is in uh, yeah. southeastern, yeah. southeastern yeah, Taipei, southern eastern part of uh, yeah. Taipei. Yeah. yeah, it's a very famous and a good university, I guess. Yeah, I remember you saying that just behind here you went jogging around there's a lovely track with the trees and so on the location I mean, when he was a student he was jogging that's uh, right yeah, yeah. Jogging a lot. are you yeah. in the jogging yeah jogging. Was that, back in the 80s uh, yes <laughs> sorry yes. Uh, and, uh, jogging uh, yeah. along, along here up to the mountain now this school has a long history doesn't it yep 40 years uh, 50 years i thought maybe. i saw a sign it was 50 years Oh, maybe uh, 81. Oh, geez. So it's back yeah. on the mainland too then, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. came from yeah. the mainland. Cool. I didn't realize it was so old, yes. I What's mean, that big building back there? <laughs> the building 101. Right? Oh, 101. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're right the out there. The of Taipei. Yeah, yeah. We couldn't resist the shot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was very obvious we're in uh, Taiwan, in Taipei. Okay, well, we've come here by. for a reason. I mean, we'd like to reminisce with Stephen about his uh, old digs, really nice yeah, place, yes. really nice school. In fact, very international school. My daughter just told me that from her school in Texas, all the international students, when they come to Taiwan to learn Chinese, this is the school they come yes. to. So it's pretty well, popular so, yeah. for that. But we're not here for that. No. It would, become, it would be good to come here and learn some more Chinese. Yeah, yeah. Well, for me, it would be, that's for sure. So uh, we're really uh, excited today that uh, Professor Parasurman from the U.S., uh, is based here for I think a week, 10 day uh, visit and uh, he's been kind enough to give us a little time today to talk about some perspectives on service quality, internationalization. He's famous for our listeners that don't know, uh, famous for? Well he's famous for basically asking a very simple question which is what is service quality? Uh, it's a bit like Einstein or uh, who was the guy that did gravity? Newton saying, why does this apple drop down to the floor? It's that kind of first principle question. But he said, well, what is service quality? And developed a whole stream of research to start looking at that issue. And it led him into various areas. So we can say that he's been really the father of a considerable amount of service theory. So it's a great honor. It's very exciting that he's been willing to share his thoughts on the development of this particular area. So we're really pretty fired up to go down. Yeah, usually our show we center on Chinese issues, but this serve qual scale that he's made, this idea of consumers based their judgment of quality based on first their expectation, uh. then the perception of what actually happens, this gap that exists, this we find is actually very universal. Only the, only the only differences are, you know, in what's the context and how exactly does it happen. So we're looking into that all the time. Lots and lots of research from Taiwan on surf ball. Yes. Stephen, I think you've used the scale before, right? Yeah. You know what I love about his stuff, I think? When you read his papers and you read his books, it doesn't say trademark. No. No? <laughs> you know, a lot of researchers do that these days. Yes. They'll say TM yeah. or R, yeah, registered, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And it's like you're not allowed to use their work or something. This is completely opposite. He's been way open. Everything's been public. It's kind of like a open source kind of effort in a yeah. way, right? Yeah, and that's so a great analogy, actually. There's just a ton of stuff. And in Taiwan, there's a ton of stuff. In Japan, there's a ton of stuff. Lots of stuff everywhere. And so we're just a big fan of him. Yeah, I think it's, uh, as you say, that I almost uh, was tempted when I was thinking what we were going to talk about today to say, well, why haven't you put a trademark on it? Because <laughs> you could have got rich that way. But uh, I guess... Uh, He's chosen not to, as you say, go the open source kind of route. So well, he's, a, he's, he's got a great reputation, a friendly guy, so he's been really gracious to allow us to talk with him today. And um, let's head into the school. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. Welcome to my... <laughs> uh, it's obviously very exciting to have someone like yourself here in terms of the fact that uh, uh, people, when they start to focus on high quality mm -hmm. research, and innovative research, it's rare to see people of this caliber mm -hmm. moving around, particularly in Taiwan. It's very innovative and exciting. So there's just a few areas I wanted to sort of explore mm -hmm. sure. with you. 
And uh, one, I think, goes back to the talk that you gave down in uh, the south in, in right. Qinggong, where you talked mm -hmm. about uh, surf coal and the right. development of surf coal. Mm -hmm. And I think very few people ask original questions. <laughs> and you started with a very simple question, which yeah. is, what is service quality? Well, right. And I think that's, uh, it's like people saying, why does the pen drop? Right. And then they develop the theory of gravity. Mm -hmm. and very few people dare to ask these mm -hmm. fresh questions and innovative mm -hmm. questions. And of course, two decades on, right. we're still finding that serve qual is relevant, but mm -hmm. also controversial. Right. And I'm wondering why you feel that this piece of research has been so enduring mm -hmm. for more mm -hmm. than two decades now. Mm -hmm. People are still right. exploring it, thinking about it, discussing it, debating right. it. Right. <coughs> well, uh, part of the uh, reason for the commercial success of Sarkwal in terms of its applicability, uh, I think, is um, is its simplicity. I mean, it it, it makes common sense. It, mm -hmm. It's it's very logical to think of it that way. Uh, but but at the same time, and there are a lot of things that are very uh, logical and very simple that don't endure. Mm. Uh, uh, and uh, and there, I think the endurance of Sirquall is because it is based on very very rigorous research. You know, it's mm. it's it's something that is very simple and after the fact looks very logical, but it didn't just drop out of thin air. <laughs> there's there's a lot of uh, you know research, a lot of sweat and tears research-wise that have preceded, uh, you know, the advent of our surf wall into the public domain. So I think, I think it's the combination of the research rigor mm. that produced surf wall and then the practical simplicity of it, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, accounts for its endurance, yeah. <clears throat> strong foundation. Strong, very strong foundation, academic foundation. Uh, and uh, again, as I said in the talk the mm -hmm. other day, uh, there's not been anything that uh, has come along to replace it. Yes. Uh, 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 there is a lot of debate, uh, yeah. and, and there, there still is a debate about mm -hmm. Sirquol. Uh, but again, it's, it's a debate about certain nuances that relate mm -hmm. to Sirquol, mm -hmm. like do we need to measure expectations? Yes. Uh, you know, does Sirquol really only have five dimensions, or should it have seven? Right. You know, nuances of that. So the debate again surrounds the, the original instrument. Mm -hmm. So that, in some ways, even giving it longer academic life. I think, mm -hmm. from a practitioner perspective, uh, Sirquall has already made its uh, mark, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, but from an academic perspective, you know, as long as there is debate about Sirquall, it endures even more. Yes, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. 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 So it's not the debate that <laughs> it, worries you, that yeah. keeps it alive. Actually. It, it keeps it alive in, academic, uh, in the academic realm, yeah, so. And I think, uh, in fact, there was another point that came out that was yeah. very interesting in your talk. You said that once you've reached the point of having a statement, people reply, and then you're given the opportunity <laughs> to, to, to respond. Reply, yeah, which, right, uh, right. And which I think is healthy for academe to, to have the debate going, because there's always new things that you can learn. Right. Yeah, yeah, so. Well, we're sitting here in yeah. Taiwan, right. which is, uh, well, at least 5,000 miles away from where I normally or, or have resided. Yes. And, of course, this is fairly typical for so many firms. Now we're talking of international, right. global reach. Mm -hmm. And how, what, what sort of impact do you think that has on the service quality issue? Sorry, because we've, uh, as you've mentioned, service yes. S uh, serve call is the Western U.S. instrument, but then firms are <laughs> reaching across that global platform. Now. Right, right. What sort right. of impact do you think that has on the service quality agenda? Um, <coughs> again, I would say that uh, yes, uh, Sirquall is a uh, Western quote unquote concept in the sense that, that the basic foundational work was done in the West. Uh, but again, I would, I would argue, and I've talked about Sirquall to a number of different audiences globally. Uh, and it does appeal. Uh, yeah, I think I think the major core components of Sirquall are very broadly applicable. Mm -hmm. uh, from so from a from a global perspective, again, uh, you know, service quality is is what it is. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, whether customers are sitting in uh, India or in Taiwan or in uh, or in the United States, where Sirquall was developed, you know, when they think of service quality, I think they think about you know, what should an excellent company be able to do? Even a consumer without any education subconsciously probably thinks about that. 
and then compares mm. that mental benchmark against what is actually being received by the mm. customer. Mm -hmm. And that's what Circle is all about, you know, mm -hmm. the measuring the gap between what... That's the beautiful part, because it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's it lets you be subjective. It's just lets, yeah, it's, it's subjective, you know, yeah. you know uh, it's the customer's perception and customer's assessment mm -hmm. is really reality. Yeah, so and, and I, core that is the core, yeah, exactly, the exactly. And I think for a long time, um, be, before Circwall came along, uh, you know, quality was often defined as uh, zero defects or conformance mm -hmm. to specifications. Uh, uh, yeah, conformance to specifications. Mm -hmm. And uh, those specifications <laughs> typically were specifications derived or. Uh, 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 um, uh, 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 come up with uh, uh, with uh, with engineers, you know, derived by engineers, uh, and that same mentality applied to services as well. Prior to Circle, yeah. you know, service companies were also saying, you know, we know what good service is, and here are the standards, and as long as we deliver to those standards. Uh, we are delivering good quality service. Yeah, well, you know, going back to like the 80s, right? Yeah, 80s, 80s, yeah, exactly. About the engineering engineering drive, approach. Defects, yeah, exactly. Let's yeah. move zero defects over to service. Service, yeah. And even zero defects. I think the big company back then was Motorola. Right. You see that they haven't done so well recently. That's right. So and when what you're delivering is the service, zero defects is a, is a good goal to have, but you're never going to achieve it. Uh, so from that perspective, uh, I think. So going back to your question of, you know, what, what, what does this mean in a global arena? Uh, I would I would say both based on uh, my travels around the world and talking to executives, uh, uh, you know, it's the the concept is very broadly applicable. Yeah. <coughs> to what extent, though, do you feel that, for example, talking to uh, the uh, CEO of Tesco's in Taiwan, the right. big hypermarket group, yeah. and uh, his conclusion was basically. Customers in UK, customers in Taiwan. Yeah. Our market research shows they want the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yet, um, visibly, if you yeah. go, for example, even to a London high street and see the Asian stores, right? Or you come here and you look at the style of store. You right. see often the local stores very narrow aisles, very mm -hmm. busy, right. very right. loud. Mm -hmm. um, the service people are often focusing on product yeah. information right. rather than where to find something in the store. Right, right. And so it was interesting because we did a very small study. Okay. What we found was that customers of the local indigenous hypermarket, mm -hmm. um, they assess the, the quality less right. than of the Tesco, mm -hmm. but their willingness to refer was in fact higher for the local chain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We felt mm -hmm. it was because m many of these indigenous Right. Expectations were better incorporated into right. the local store. Right, right. And I'm just wondering how far, at what point you feel the relevance of Circle kind of breaks across a cultural reach that's from the west <coughs> to the east. Yeah, yeah. And again, um, you know, the, the, the universality of Circle mm -hmm. in part derives from the fact that it's subjective. Um, and I think the expectations versus mm -hmm. perceptions type of paradigm. Uh, really travels well, uh, and that actually would would explain the phenomenon that you're just uh, you know that your study you know j j just found about you know why is it that even though customers think that Tesco's you know quality is a little bit higher, you know they're probably thinking about quality in terms of the overall image of Tesco. You know it's, it's higher because it's a, you know it's it's a UK based firm, so uh, it's, it's higher, uh, but when it comes to where I feel comfortable, you know, sure. who I would recommend, you know, this, you know, mom and pop type of store, Taiwanese store, uh, is actually, uh, you know, better able to deliver right. to my expectations, yeah. you know, yeah. in terms of what I care about, and I feel more comfortable. Uh -huh. um, so, so you're arguing almost from the point of <laughs> the saying that cultural yeah. equivalent issue that the dimension is valid, but yeah, the, the cultural perspective on the dimension may be somewhat maybe, different. Maybe different, yeah, the expectations may be different mm -hmm. based on cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, what, what is more important, what is less important might, might actually vary across mm -hmm. cultures, but the, but the overall uh, uh, paradigm holds. That's what I love about the uh, yeah. model. Yeah. Transfer yeah. it. Transfer it. Yeah. In management practice, lots of times people get hung up on their 
source expectations. And right. They project it onto the onto the onto the customer. You need to be careful. Yeah, that's right. Go to the customers, customers and sometimes. Sellers, yeah, their expectations exactly. Expectations could be yeah very different, but the, the point of the model is not what are their expectations, but you know how important the, is this? Is not this to say yeah, that right, the same right. as mine, right? <laughs> yeah, I think exactly. It's the cultural of cool of yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You have to be careful not to make it you know absolute. Right. That's right. It's it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a relative uh, measure. Uh, uh, one of this, yeah. Right. Yeah. The uh, one of the last parts in your talk, you moved uh -huh. to technology readiness. Oh, right. You were talking right. about yeah. the people's fairly high technology readiness, uh -huh. but a sort of declining usage. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they're ready, but don't yeah. seem to be actually <laughs> engaging. Yeah. Well. And uh, I know, uh, Clyde, you've got a take on the I'm fact that... I'm a bit of a tech nut. Tech nut. Yeah, yeah, right. so, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, <coughs> at that sense, I mean, when I talk to students yeah. now, yeah. I yeah. say, was this old guy teaching you how to use technology? technology. Right, right. Uh, where do you think this is leading? Because I remember you showed the graphs, and I was moving <coughs> right, a little right, more quickly right, at that right, stage. Right, but it right. seemed to be a very interesting sort of finding that people yeah. were ready, <coughs> and even younger people, yeah, yeah. that sense of usage was Well, not over, over time, even the younger people, uh, like your daughter sitting there perhaps, I mean, she probably grew up with the Internet, uh, and it's like brushing teeth uh, uh, for her. Uh, yeah. Whereas for us old fogies, you know, it's yeah. probably a little bit... <laughs> A little bit new, at least when it came came around. Uh, but but your daughter, 20 years later, might be facing uh, some new technologies that we haven't even thought, you know, can't even think about uh, today. That might be coming down the pike. That might really be revolutionary, uh, you know, for for the younger folks today. Yeah, yeah. So from that perspective, you know, some of the technology readiness issues. Yeah. Uh, in terms of their mental ability to cope with it and grasp it mm -hmm. and then use it uh, would 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 still be very relevant and that's the whole uh, uh, basis for this concept of technology readiness that's it's not so much mm -hmm. a measure of technical savvy uh, but it's more a mental measure of how you cope with something really radically new that comes down the pike yeah. uh -huh. uh, so this again is sort of a relative thing in the sense that you know, what might be considered a new technology by you and me may not be considered as a new technology by the young people, uh, you yeah. know, sitting over there. Yes. Uh -huh. so, 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 so it's not an issue for them when it comes to Internet or using mobile phone or mobile technologies. Uh -huh. But 20 years from now, if some other new technology comes down the pike, then they'll be facing those same mental uh, kinds of issues. And again, as a technology you ages, mm. the relevance of technology readiness with respect to that particular technology decreases. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. You know, no, uh, yeah. That, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right, right, okay. Uh, if, you know, the, the, the concept of technology readiness uh, is, uh, the, the relevance of it, uh, I think, is for, is for radically new things that, that people aren't that familiar with yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And over a period of time, people do become familiar with technologies, and uh, then everybody starts using it. And the the the, the point at which that ha happens, yes. uh, TR technology readiness is no longer all that relevant. Um, uh, for example, a hundred years ago, automobiles were a new technology, yeah. Yeah. and people were afraid of of automobiles, and there are only very very few people that would dare. To sit in a car and then and drive it. Yeah. That's a great but, analogy. So the people, but, but now, the people then would be <coughs> yeah, yeah. Like so into it, they so, would know how to take the engine apart. Yeah, they would exactly. Know how to do everything. Right, right, right. But then, in, a hundred years later, yeah. you get in it, you turn the key, and you know, yeah. it's, it's not a new it, thing. It you just automatically norm. use it. You use it. You use it. Yeah, exactly. It becomes part of your life. Yes, it's like so, the phone. Yeah, yeah like exactly. Uh, and and the, the reason I think uh, technology readiness is going to continue to be of increasing relevance. To companies is because technological developments are seem to be happening at an accelerating uh, uh, pace. The proliferation of technologies is just uh, amazing. And in fact, in one of the slides that uh, we we talked about, I I showed that even really innovative people aren't able to keep up with uh, with all of the technological developments that are coming down the pike. Actually, we see a steady decline. In, in people's point. people's ability to keep up with technological development. So as long as that is happening, 
technology readiness as a as a concept is going to be uh, going to be quite critical. Yeah. I think. I think, yeah. you, I think this was uh, a topic of one of your books, like four or five Te years ago. Techno ready marketing. marketing. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes right, that's right. right, right that's right. right. Yeah. I got that at ebook actually. Ah. Okay. Yeah. One of your ah, ebooks. Okay. <laughs> e yeah. So he's time. an e he's an explorer. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, actually, we we yeah. talk about a segmentation yeah. of yeah. people, uh, you know, based on their TRs. Yeah. Yeah. So the the really high TR folks are the are the explorers. Yes. In fact, that sort of brings us very nicely to the uh, to the next point right. because um, I think there's that tension always in research right. between creating something that's kind of interesting as a researcher. You look at it and you go, "Oh wow, yeah. you know, that's very right. really interesting." Right. Mm -hmm. But then when you're sitting over a table with a, an executive, yeah, yeah, you say, well, so what? Yeah, so what? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how? How, because it was interesting your talk, you yeah. drew this point out yeah, quite yeah. a number of times right, right, right. and linked the practical relevance mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. research from the solid base right. to mm -hmm, what mm -hmm. an executive mm -hmm. would need. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering uh, your thoughts on how to make that work effectively in terms of... Well, that's a, that's a good uh, good question. Uh, you know, from my perspective, based on my you know 25 plus years of working in, on this particular topic, um, I I always felt and continue to feel that you know really impactful research uh, has to start with what's important to practitioners. Uh, you know you start with you know what are the key problems that companies are facing, have some understanding of that, and then go back and see you know how you can use your academic credentials, academic training to try and explore, start exploring those issues in a very, very systematic, mm -hmm. scientific way mm -hmm. so, that, so that you generate knowledge that mm -hmm. would cut across industry boundaries, would be broadly applicable to a whole set of mm -hmm. issues that, uh, that are faced by lots of different companies. Mm -hmm. so, so from my perspective, um, uh, you know the, the 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 reason I think uh, the the PZB model and Sarqual and all the other things that I've followed from then on are are so enduring mm -hmm. is because the starting point has always been, you know, what are the issues that companies are facing, the practical issues, starting it's with that. Now, not everybody, everybody agrees with that. Uh, uh, you know, some people do mm -hmm. basic research; they call it. Although in some ways, I would consider the research that I've done as also being basic. But, but I guess the key difference, you know, the basic research is driven by some overriding issues that are out there uh, mm -hmm. that are keeping execs uh, awake at night, yeah. uh, with which they are, they are struggling. Yeah, yeah. Um, and in the because that's really the sourcing the ideas, right, it's really right, grounding exactly. it yeah. in the yeah. external reality, yeah. and then pulling it, it in, exactly. and addressing that in that uh, from a rigorous right. scientific right. Uh, right. basis. Right. But then also mm -hmm. there's the closing the loop, which right. I think is also right. interesting yeah. Yeah. because mm -hmm. uh, there may be a problem. One can research that problem, right. but then how do you <laughs> yeah. effectively close the loop? Yeah. Again, that's another another good question. You know, the closing is critical too because you have to go back. To the executives and say, okay, here are the concepts you can use, um, and and that uh, that becomes a little tricky because if you do really rigorous scientific research, in some ways it also becomes esoteric. You know, you start using academic terms, you start using language that falls under so-called scientific method, uh, and there is certainly a time and, and a place for that kind of language to describe what you're doing, and in fact. When we published uh, the initial work in the journal of marketing, journal of retailing, mm -hmm. you know, we developed those kinds of articles where we used those kinds you of terms. To. You have to. Uh, but then on the other hand, once you place your work, place your finding in such scholarly journals, that adds credibility to the work. Mm -hmm. But simultaneously, we also sort of uh, recast the same findings in language that executives can easily understand. Uh, so we wrote articles in Business Horizons, which is a very, very practitioner-oriented yeah. journal. Sloan Management Review, which a lot of practitioners read. Uh, in 1990, we wrote Delivering Quality Service, which is a business book, yes. uh -huh. which really talks about the GAPS model and CERC wall mm -hmm. in, in terms that executives can understand. Yeah. 
But at the same time, executives can take comfort in the fact that it's not, you know, somebody sitting and armchair theorizing and coming up with these ideas. It's really based on rigorous research that has passed the test of academic credibility. Uh, and so, so you have to do both. Uh, you have to do both. You know, there are some books that are very practically very applicable. Uh, they become bestsellers overnight. They also fall by the wayside overnight. Very quickly. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, and, and then there are, on the other hand, there are some very, very, really excellent articles that have appeared in our major journals, but, but nobody even thinks of, about them except except a few, uh, you know, very rigorous academics that work in that area. Maybe eventually they might have an impact, mm -hmm. but but that's the, that's the reverse problem. You know, there you do very good research, but because they don't have any immediate application. Uh, uh, they they just sit there for for quite at least uh, in, the, in the near term they just sit Sometimes there. It seems hard though. I mean, this yeah. is more of a kind of personal question. <laughs> right. We just had a paper published in the Journal of Retail. It just came out. Last yes. Month. Okay. Yeah. That's after five years yeah. of work. Yeah. Sometimes you get to the end of the road and you feel like. Oh, okay, yes. That yes. Has, yeah. yeah. That has been so I felt long. many times <laughs> that way in my, in my career. <laughs> yeah. 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 Any more yeah. Energy, energy to do, to do it. Yeah. Right. Right. How, uh, as a researcher, how do you address that kind of issue? You felt it many times. How well, you yeah, we've felt many times. It's frustrating, and sometimes it's not just. Uh, uh, you know, struggling with one journal, you know, some journal might reject your work. Oh, yeah. uh, and then you have to go back and get more Right, right. And that's very frustrating. And that's and then you keep trying, you know. So, so it's, it's, it's an arduous uh, process. But again, personally for me, what has kept me going and uh, sort of revived my energy source, you know, during these periods of uh, sort of depressed, <laughs> demotivated uh, states. Uh, uh, is, uh, is, the, is the excitement of, of creating new knowledge and the and exp excitement of uh, you know, creating something that is helpful to practitioners. Uh, again, as I also mentioned uh, in my talk the other day, uh, much of the uh, criticism and debate about Sirkwal and related literature has stemmed from the academic community, not from the practitioner community. Uh, you know, practitioners just uh, you know don't you know don't have a problem with with uh, with this. So so that's what keeps it going. You know that you're doing something good, uh, and then and then it gives you the energy, boosts the energy. So so it keeps you it keeps you going. Another important thing too for for academics as a researcher, and I think this is the point I also emphasized. Your your research needs to be programmatic. Uh, you know, if your research is programmatic, where you're not trying to solve you know the entire a set of problems related to a particular issue in one fell swoop, mm -hmm. you know, you, you need to keep on going. You know, you solve one issue or one aspect of the issue and then, okay, you, you covered that, but then there are a whole host of other questions. You, you, problematic. Mean, you, mean you, pro you maybe have a pro programmatic. Problem, but you're taking a piece. And a a piece programmatic. Piece. Programmatic, yeah, uh, yeah. programmatic research to address a, 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 a topic. Are, are a problem, piece by piece, piece, by, piece by piece, road, you know, right each now. each building on the other. So you know that that, that you have a goal. As, as an uh, editor, you might know. I mean, it, 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 for us as researchers, you're often, you know, yeah. hey, grab that topic, grab that topic. Exactly. That answer. that demotivates you, you know, that, because <laughs> then you know you're you're doing it piecemeal. So so when when you're done with the project after five years, when you get a publication, you say, ah. <laughs> I'm done with it. Yes. Uh, now let yeah. me relax a bit, and then I will think about something else. I see, I see. So as long as you know that you know you need to continue, you have a journey kind of like to cover. Yellow brick yeah. road. Going <laughs> exactly. To that you're following. Going to yeah. see okay. So it's just yeah. one milestone, but yeah. then you know you have, yeah. there are other yeah. things that gives you again focus. So you're a strong yeah. proponent of researchers having kind of an overall program. 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 I mean, it doesn't mean that you should never do anything beyond your program, but do you know even if you stray away from the yellow brick road. You know, make sure that you have a return path somewhere, yeah. uh, where you are uh, somehow you could connect yeah. that to what you're doing. Uh, you know, and in fact, that came out beautifully in yeah. the presentation. Yeah. The, the way that the serve call and it led into right. looking right. at the exactly. expectations right. and uh, that uh, that explanation right. just came right. out beautifully as a. Uh, seeing an endpoint somewhere right. far over, right. so it's just milestones. Yeah. It's easy, right. for, you know, it's so easy for us to look at your work and see that because we got yeah. all this literature and all right. these replication right. stuff. <laughs> but as researchers, it's good to hear you give us that kind of input. Yeah, and again, you know, um, in in fairness and honesty, I would say that 
you know, starting in the early 1980s, I didn't have such a roadmap in mind at all. <laughs> so don't feel discouraged that <laughs> you're not able to see it. You know, to, to, to me too, sometimes that uh, you know, I go back and look in a, look at a ama- uh, uh, look with amazement mm-hmm. at the fact that oh yeah, this all seems to fit. Uh-huh. <laughs> Uh, but 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 on the other hand, you know, I did have this this feeling that you know we're not going to solve all of this in one project, and we need to keep going. So uh, to the extent that uh, you know, budding researchers or young people coming into academia uh, can can think programmatically to begin with, I think they can have a leg up, rather than you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So especially in an environment like uh, Taiwan, and there's so much pressure for to, academics to, to get a paper. Get a paper here, get a paper there. I, uh, yeah, there is some value. I mean, I think public publishing in academic journals, you know, takes certain skills. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, so one way to demonstrate that is to say, you know, is to show that you can publish. But then, you know, in, my, in the bigger scheme of things, I think that's just one small part. You also need to have an impact on the field, not just especially be able to... You know, an editor, this is the thing you're looking for, I think. You don't you don't want people just sending you a piece, a piece, a piece. <coughs> you're thinking you want people to have some kind Yeah, yeah, people, yeah, people, and, and again, as an editor, I can also see that, you know, people that have a programmatic stream have, a, have an easier time getting their work published. Mm-hmm. Because they can talk much more authoritatively, and if reviewers criticize certain things, they can say, well, you know, here's my response, and this is why I think, you know, we are right and you're wrong. Not in so many abrupt terms, yes, but, um, but but you, you feel more confident. Um, so that's another reason uh, to, to have programmatic research, yeah, then you become the expert. That's my experience too, you know, yeah. if, I, if I veer <laughs> out of my Chinese retailing stuff yeah. and go yeah. another area, it's interesting, but then you find out, yeah. hey, there's a whole stream of <laughs> literature you missed. You, you didn't missed know about it, you it. didn't know, and you say, oh yeah, yeah, I probably did, then you go and look at it. Yeah. So, but, but when you're researching in an area, and then you're producing and publishing in an area, it becomes easier to, sure. to respond yeah. uh, to great. criticism because you know. You know the area quite well. Good yeah. advice. Yeah. I, yeah, I think so, that's, uh, yeah. Yeah, the, the, so it fits so well with the yeah. presentation you gave right. and how it explains mm. that focus on a mm. track that builds systematically right. Right. from one right. step to, right. to another. Right. Uh, perhaps uh, I know our time is squeezing right. up, mm-hmm. so maybe just as a sort of closing right. thought. Um, this, uh, we've been talking about going back to the mid-80s. We're now in right. sort of 2008. Right. Time moves so fast. Yes. Uh, what, what do you see on the horizon in terms of the sort of service area for the next mm-hmm. 10, 15 years, sort of developing? Yeah. <coughs> Again, this is a point that I made in the in the presentation. The way I see it, uh, I think more and more services and delivery of customer service uh, are, are, are going to occur through some form of technology. I mean, there's no escaping the fact. Uh, I think technology is going to pay, play an increasing role in the delivery of services, either directly, where customers have to directly interact with technologies, or indirectly, where the deliverers of the service are going to be uh, 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 um, supported with a lot of you know, technology-based systems. Uh, so either directly or indirectly, technology is going to play an increasing role. Uh, so from a, from, a, from a research perspective, I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity still to, to do a lot of research in the intersection between technology and, and, and service. Uh, uh, and from a, from a practitioner's perspective, also there, is, uh, there are a lot of challenges in terms of how do you intelligently introduce technology-based systems? You know, what is the optimal mix of high-tech versus high-touch? I, I think is going to continue to be an issue from a practical perspective. In fact, that's one of the things that got me interested in this whole domain of technology readiness because co- companies are struggling with finding the right balance. Uh, 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 and, and, and academics can, can do research on those topics and help companies come up with, uh, or, or come up with frameworks that can help companies uh, you know, achieve that balance. Uh, and move mm. people down away <coughs> from the face-to-face contact into into the SSD yeah yeah or or or, 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 or 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 come up with multiple mm. systems mm-hmm. uh, depending on the composition of the markets to which you are trying to cater. Mm-hmm. You know, if you are basically catering to a market which is fairly homogeneous and pretty tech-savvy like you you are, 
uh, or, uh, and high TR, yeah. uh, then you can more comfortably switch from high touch to high tech. Yeah. On the other hand, if you're dealing with a fairly heterogeneous market with lots of different segments of mm -hmm. so customers, not all of whom might be equally tech savvy or equally mentally ready to accept technology, then you need to be more careful about about switching from high tech to high touch. Yeah, these yeah. issues are so complex. Yeah, right. Yeah. I think one of the great examples, of course, is from the tech boom bubble, the web van. Web van, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. It's such a big build up, but then <laughs> they're, they're a supermarket, but that market is so heterogeneous. Right, that was the right, big problem right, you run into. Right, so you right. run into the tech, but then you're hitting a heterogeneous market. Right. Nobody's happy. Right. And then just crash and burn. So right, it's exactly. So hard. Exactly. It is hard. So I, I think the academics can do a lot to do systematic research and, and help executives uh, preempt and then avoid these kinds of problems. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Well, thank you very much for your uh, time Thank you. My, my pleasure. My pleasure. Enjoy great. talking to you. Great. And, uh, really okay. good. Good. great to have you here in Taiwan. Enjoy, enjoy my the pleasure. rest of your stay. I know you're okay. busy. busy <laughs> the whole time. And I hope we can be uh, sufficiently interesting that you'll uh, pay another visit back here. It will be my pleasure to come back. Right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Much. Okay. Good. Good. Thank you. So, really interesting kind of discussion talking about service quality and uh, how that was going to sort of move into the uh, global arena and some of the issues there with with that so I saw you sitting up suddenly Clyde as we moved into the whole technology uh, piece that obviously got you and I think he clicked that you were a bit of a technology guy so were well, there were a few things that sort of twisted your screw as it were well he was easy to agree to be on our podcast which shows a little bit of technology readiness right there yeah. I've read his uh, book about being technology ready and all of this stuff it's very interesting and um, you know I wish we had more time yeah. But I think the idea of being technology ready, I think he hit on a point right there, which is maybe our perception of technology ready is not the technology ready of the young people today. So, And then when he used the automobile example, that really brought it home to me because, you know, in the turn of the century, people who would know how to use automobiles would also know a lot about how to use the all the details of it. You know, you had to crank it. You had to know many things about the valves and how to get the gas. And, and the exactly, for the right. Ford, you had the toolbox right there. I exactly, mean, it was part right, of the appeal. Yeah, right. It was so, ready to so work on. for us, you know, I'm, I'm always stuck kind of in the 80s where my students were, the ones who were using the computers were really into it and knew it. Nowadays, my students can barely do anything. I've seen <laughs> students spend 15 minutes trying to get a USB key and they can't get it in because they're trying to shove it into the Ethernet jack. <laughs> and so, you know, and this always, you know, I'm saying, are these guys really ready for technology? And I think his point is, that technology is already passed. We don't need to be ready for it now. We just turn the key and drive it. It's that simple. These guys need to be ready for the next technology with something we don't even see yet. So that was a very interesting point that really kind of rang my bell a little bit. Yes, I could see, as I say, that it was like plugging you in. It's sort of you sat up in the chair. And I think for you too, Stephen, there are yeah. some points you sort of clicked with. And yeah, maybe the TI, the yeah. technology readiness yeah. index, means yeah. uh, uh, the com company can do yeah. something yeah. Uh, more simple for yeah. the, the people who, not, who yeah. do not have the readiness. Yeah. And the, yeah. the high tech and the high uh, high touch uh, yeah. can, can do the balance. Uh -huh. balance. Uh -huh. Maybe be, because a lot of the, the young people, mm -hmm. elder people, uh -huh. old people, right? Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they would like to uh, the easy stuff, uh -huh. not the uh, tech technology in the yeah. they, they will uh, buy your product. Uh -huh. you, you have the high technology but the high touch yeah. product and kind of combine them yeah, together. Yeah. yeah, I think that combination, that was really another interesting part of what yes. he was talking about and the struggle that companies have to try and make that work, which I think was interesting when he was talking about research and uh, exactly your point, sort of, Stephen, that he extended it to the idea that what are we looking at here? If you want to do some research that's interesting, it better be relevant as well to the outside world. So kind of starting outside, bring it inside to the research, and then taking an answer back. I think that was also very interesting, the grounding it in that, like that practical, practical stuff, problem. Right? Yes. Yeah. Well, in fact, that was a strong flavor from his presentation that he's done elsewhere. Practical emphasis. Yeah, he really talked about the research, and then he says, you know, how does this work in a practical sense and he gave a 
really interesting example from IBM reinforcing measuring expectation and perception you know the old uh, debate that's gone on around that and he showed if you put that around you have your service quality point measurement plus where do where does expectation sit where does perception sit and you get that uh, that gap between yeah. what's, what's desired yeah. essentially and what's possibly adequate the whole thing changes completely and he explains that point very well how methodologically as well you've got a problem with uh, doing perceptions only and how you will get a better result methodologically but the practical result is much better looking at the gap between what people think is a minimum and against the desired level, adequate and desired. He showed that very, very well. well he I says think that's IBM the you people. Were on too, you know, it always seems to be that it's easy to say we're looking at expectations and perceptions, uh, but then too many people just automatically center on the perception because they think they know what the expectation is. You see, yeah. there's an assumption. I know what the yeah. expectation is. The expectation is the movie's good. Yeah. The movie's are a great example because everybody knows it's so subjective, yeah. right? Uh, but when we look at supermarkets, uh, when we look at uh, hypermarkets where we look at wet markets uh, then this kind of idea breaks down all of a sudden yeah. because if you're from a supermarket perspective all of a sudden the wet market doesn't make any sense of what the expectation is so you really need to go to the customer and I think that's the point and one of the reasons that the surfball model can last so long and he said it himself it's all that subjective perspective yeah. and you can it's plug in anything yeah. the relativism that yeah, goes the, with the it the maybe a yeah. template yeah. major uh, yeah. uh, different kind of uh, customer segmentation what they want, what they expect, expect and so, what yeah. they perceive. Yeah. Exactly. So it's a template and you yeah, can put template. anything yeah, into yeah. it and it still fundamentally works. So you cannot get around that very human uh, perception versus yes. expectation. I mean, it's, too, it's just too fundamental, right? So. Yes, he makes that point so well on expectation, what's desired, what's adequate, and then fitting in the perception. And he showed uh, that in terms of IBM. Um, of course the score is very high on perception people think they're doing very well and then when you fit what people actually think is possible and what they think is a minimum standard there's a big surprise you know. a it's, so I think that relativism and fitting all the pieces together in terms of perception and people's embedded expectation it's very very powerful and relative across cultures yeah. as well which you touched on yeah, I think that was pretty good. I was impressed. Yes. I think he's really good to make his points clearly in a very short time. Uh-huh. Yeah, so he's an impressive guy. Yes, the real deal, I think, the when you say Phil say. The real stuff. <laughs> the real stuff. <laughs> Great. Friendly guy, too. Really friendly. Yeah, and that's what I find about a lot of really high-level research. You know, a lot, a lot of these guys are just so easy to contact and get yeah. along, ask for some input, and just really open. So I really appreciate that. That's right. These sort of people. Uh, supportive. Supportive. Yes, positive. Yeah, yeah, positive. 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 And yeah, I think positive. it's easy to get negative. You know, uh-huh. like he said, he gets down doing so much research, and then he must get so much junk submitted to him as an editor. You know, it's got to be, it's got to be easy to get negative. But he's not. He's totally positive. So that's right. great. Oh, an eye opener on the journal. Yes, uh, fifteen percent acceptance for JSR. Fifteen percent. Yeah, JSR. Yeah. JSR. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yes, I, I think that's point of picking up, getting the energy back. Yeah. Ten, ten to fifteen <laughs> percent, I think, is about right for all, all your top journals. Ten to fifteen yeah. percent. Yeah. And so this is tough. So, good luck. Good luck. <laughs> we need it. <laughs> you know, we will conquer. We've got to get our energy. Yeah, we've got to get our energy, like he says. Build up our energy. Be positive. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> okay. My energy's gone. I'm off. <laughs> <laughs> This is Talk of Asian Marketing with a special emphasis on localized Chinese consumer behavior.